Hi everyone, my name is Judy Higgins and I am a science teacher in Lawrence, Massachusetts. If you are anything like me, when you found out six, seven weeks ago that school was closing and you were responsible for teaching your students remotely, you panicked. I panicked. I had no idea how I was going to do this. And I felt particularly concerned because it was science. I was used to doing all these incredibly cool activities in my classroom. We had spent such a big part of our time together learning how to do amazing Socratic seminars. My students could talk to each other. They could argue respectfully. They were confident speakers. I didn't know how I was going to replicate all of that. I did not think it was possible. And then I thought, I have to do something. And I need to do my best to think about the great culture of learning and thinking and curiosity that I had promoted in my classroom. And I felt that it was my responsibility to figure out, could I do it? Well, there is a way to do it. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today during this session. I'm going to give you a lot of tools that I've used, a lot of modifications that I've done to make it possible to continue to foster the great curiosity that our kids need to be great scientists, to be great thinkers, how to maintain a rigorous and student-centered remote lear science learning environment. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how I was able to replicate a lot of what went on. So a big part of my intention was to continue to continue to have rigor in the classroom, but not reinventing the wheel. There wasn't time to do that. We had to start teaching now, and there weren't a lot of weeks left in the year. We'll talk about how can you use the NOADAM curriculum to maintain familiar routines, even when learning from home. I have a lot of tools and techniques to continue to foster the kind of independence that we've come to expect in our learners. We'll talk about how I am doing daily reading, discussion. We've worked on creating testable questions, developing a lab, and sharing those results and conclusions. So I looked at my, the No Adam curriculum that I had at home, and I looked at this is what we do. We read, we discuss, we develop questions, and then we develop a lab. And I started to feel, okay, this is how I'm gonna do it. This will look familiar to our students, and it's familiar to me. I really needed something that I felt I was used to. So to start out with the reading process, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk you through each step. So I provided the student readers. I was so grateful that we could simply make those provided to the kids, and every day I would assign a reading. I would also assign a question or an activity that they could do which was familiar to them and familiar to me. As always, I really encourage, when you can, work with a friend. You can work with a sibling at home. They may be older or younger. This is a really engaging curriculum. And I would always require that they would have to respond online to at least one other classmate's reply seminar style. So just like they were in small groups in school, they would continue to have that ongoing discussion whenever possible. I 
I felt that I would have to begin with framing each week with a guided question. Now, I first thought about, I can't exactly give the same kind of question that we would give in the classroom, which is going to lead to an investigation that they didn't have the materials at home to do. So I would think about how I could modify a unit question. So I'd look at the standard. We were given standards that we were to use over the last few weeks of school. So I'd look at that. I would think about what materials do they have at home that they could put together some kind of an investigation that was still one of the concepts that they were expected to learn. So from there, I would simply modify a unit question. For example, how does friction transfer energy out of objects? So thinking about big ideas and what will work from their homes. Now, I did uh, continue to do all my assignments using Google Classroom. I chose that for a lot of reasons. Most of our students already were using that on a regular basis, not as much for science, but they were familiar with it for ELA. It was also something that was relatively familiar to me. And I did not want to introduce a lot of things that I had to learn or that the students had to learn. So every day, I post an assignment and remind the students via Class Dojo. We also all use Class Dojo that they were to look at the assignments. The first week was challenging, lots of questions from students and parents, but I would say by the end of the first week, they were really good at checking in every day and doing the assignments. One of the tools that we used in class, when class was still going on as normal classroom time, we used the Picture Thinking Graphic Organizer. This is in your No Adam material, and if you haven't used it yet, get familiar with it. It is so incredibly helpful. The way that the students use this is that they can either at the beginning of a unit they can look at the cover you can look at at the beginning of a lesson the pictures included in the lesson or they can look at some of the no atom visuals and the object is is to simply have them start to think about what's going on here what do i think i'm going to learn so before there's even any reading. So I had trained them during the, during the regular school time. You look at a picture and you simply focus. What's an object you see there? It might be a tree. It might be a dog sled. It might be a body of water. That's it. That's all they have to write down in the object. Secondly, what's an action? You might see water flowing. You might see grass growing. And then next, a property. Anything. And some students would be, look at simply a color. That's fine. They might look at a surface. That surface looks snowy. And then, this is where the thinking comes in. What do I think I'm going to learn about as I read this? When I used this in the classroom, it was really exciting to me how much the students took risks. They were far more willing to start taking risks with simply looking at pictures. Students who were uncomfortable reading, were uncomfortable asking questions, got really, really excited about this. After number two, where it says what I think it tells us, then is the task of doing the reading. And that 
becomes exciting because this is the students feel this is a mystery. I want to figure out, am I right? And this is such a great self-differentiating tool because some students are simply very literal, just simply writing down exactly what they see. We have other students who are making incredible connections from units that they just finished, thinking about, oh wait, I already know that we already talked about decomposition. That I'm already seeing in that picture something going on. After they finished reading, I use, would usually go a page at a time, how has my thinking changed? And I would encourage students, because sometimes students would say, well, it hasn't changed. I would encourage them, but is there more that you know now? Can you add something to your thinking? That's also a change in thinking. So this is something that I use a lot at the beginning of the week because it's familiar to students and it gets them thinking. This is one of the, from the fifth grade student reader, this is one of the visuals. And this is another way that I would use picture thinking is by posting one of these visuals and having them go through that routine and fill out the picture thinking visual. What do you see? What's an action? And this is a really good one because they could say, you know, the object, person on a sled, action, running, the property, they would often look at the snow. Is the snow smooth? Is it icy? And to start thinking about forces. Now, again, this is a fifth grade, but you can look at third, fifth, sixth. All of these would be really appropriate for the picture thinking. Now, I just wanted to show the kind of questions that I would post. And this is an example of a student response. Why do you think that, a roller coast, that roller coasters have lots of hills? And two, what's the connection between gravity and roller coasters? One of the things that I wanted to continue to do is get them to continue to think, not asking right there questions. This is the end of the year. And we've done a lot of work in not just going back to the text and dragging out something, but having to think. It doesn't tell you exactly why they have a lot of hills. It doesn't exactly tell you the connection between gravity and roller coasters. So this was a student response. <clears throat> the first hill on a roller coaster has to be the highest. People who design a roller coaster need to know about forces and motion. Roller coasters work because of gravity. As the roller coaster cars move up the hill, they are getting more potential energy. This is this is form of potential energy called gravitational energy. So obviously we had done some work on reviewing what is potential energy, what is gravitational energy. So this was a good response that I could give this student feedback that they had done a really good job thinking beyond the text, thinking about what, what else do you know that you can connect this with. <clears throat> now the next one that we want to talk about is the second part of where we're, where we're leading our students, and that's the discussion component. We had discussion all the time. Students always worked in groups of three or four. They did all their reading together. They did their picture thinking together. They filled out graphic organizers together. So discussion was an ongoing component. It's different now. So I had to think a little bit, how could I promote discussion whenever possible? So within classroom assignments, I would always try to utilize the kind of language that we would use during seminars. 
Is there another way to describe friction? Is there another way to describe force? At Zoom meetings. At Zoom meetings, Zoom meetings were a little bit more challenging than I had anticipated. I assumed that I had a bunch of students who literally never stopped talking. And so I thought we could just hop right into Zoom meetings and have a great Socratic seminar, even though we were distant, even though they were apart. Well, boy, was I wrong. The first meeting was really hard, <laughs> and it felt really, really long. And I learned a lot from that. The students were not comfortable talking over Zoom. They were extremely shy, and they even had a hard time at the beginning even typing into the chat box. So I had to really think about making sure that I would start to assign things, my Zoom meetings were on Wednesday, start to assign things on Monday, come to Zoom ready to answer this question. And that started to help a lot, and I also learned to utilize my students who were more comfortable talking, and I would get in touch with them privately before the Zoom meeting, and give them some time to say, would you feel comfortable starting this discussion? And that worked really well, because as always, once we had somebody talking, others were more comfortable following along. The other way that I have generated some really exciting discussion was bringing parents into the conversation. So as I said at the beginning, I use Class Dojo. Now Class Dojo became my best friend, one, because 90% of our population, English is not their first language, and many of the parents speak little to no English. So Class Dojo translates everything. And this was so helpful. I've talked to parents that I have never laid eyes on the entire year, and now I have parents asking questions and being involved. So one of the things that I started doing was, I call it the Class Dojo Challenge. I'm just going to show. This is a Class Dojo Challenge, and I would put out a weekly question to the parents and tell them, ask your student to explain something. And I started out, I gave them choices. And then I sort of narrowed it down as we were working and was really specific. And I told the parents, your student can videotape, you can videotape your student explaining it to you, your student can write it down and bring it to the Zoom meeting, or your student can simply submit it on Google Classroom. And that was amazing to me because I heard from, there were two students in particular who hadn't done a single bit of work for weeks, never logged into Google Classroom. And I knew they knew how because they had done it in school, but simply for whatever reason, weren't motivated to do it. And these two different students both submitted a video. And I can't, I can't play this because it shows the student's face. But he simply, he, his mom took a video of him explaining gravity to her. And it was really wonderful. And it was just exciting to me because it was another way that a student could engage in discussion and bring the parent into the home because the parent was really proud and the parent had talked to me later about they had had a really hard time trying to get their student to log in and do anything. So this became this student's way of communicating a lot and I felt real comfortable. I will be so happy 
modifying. I told him, you can do any assignment you want. You can answer the questions with videos. And he has done a lot of that. I want to go back to this previous slide because I also want to show you another form of discussion that I have utilized. And I really like this form for the students, again, that feel comfortable doing that. So this was a question that I had asked after an assignment. My question was, what would happen if you, leave, if you left an ice cream cone outside on a hot summer day? So we've been talking about states of matter. We've been talking about physical changes. So this student's reply, If you leave an ice cream outside on a hot summer day, it will, it will melt. Solid ice cream will gain heat, causing it to turn to a liquid. So that's one. An example of physical change using ice cream, when it's a hot summer day, if you leave an ice cream cone outside, it would melt. So that means the solid ice cream would gain heat, causing it to turn to a liquid. However, the ice cream will not change its chemical structure because it will have the same exact properties. So two students, two very, very different answers. Here's a reply. I like what Blank said about the ice cream gaining heat. That is the same as the relationship question on Monday. This was exciting to me because at the beginning of the week, I had asked another question about what's the relationship between heat and changing states of matter. So this is a really good seminar type discussion question. These are the type of responses that I would always highlight during a Zoom meeting and read these to the students to give credit to the students that were doing that sort of thing and to also help the kids look at it and say, okay, that's not that hard. I can do that. And that is one of the requirements. And a lot of the students who were avoiding that particular part of the requirement, they would answer the question, but then they wouldn't respond to another student. That rose after the first few Zoom meetings when I would read those. I started to have more and more students replying to each other. <clears throat> we're moving into three, which is starting to look at a question. What question are we going to focus on? What question are we going to do an investigation about? One of the tools that I use that I really loved it in the classroom, but I love it so much more from home. And it's called I Notice I Wonder. Really, really simple chart and the kids can set it up. I sometimes enclose it in an assignment or have them bring it to a Zoom meeting, but it's simple enough that the kids can just do it themselves. Just take out a piece of paper and write, I notice I wonder on the top. The way that I use this is to help them practice being curious. That's one of the things that I felt like at the beginning of every year, I really had to drag that out of students. What do you think about that? Are you curious about that? And that was something that I saw such great strides where students would ask questions about everything. So the way that I use this for distance learning, I would start out with sometimes a video clip either at a Zoom meeting or on a Google assignment, and they would simply fill out the chart. What do I notice? And again, we did this together first, so they understood that you can notice anything. You can notice that the ball is rolling really fast, and then it slowed down. You can notice that the rabbit looks scared. You can notice that that plant looks dead. Those are all notices. And then I wonder. So with the video clip, I wonder why the ball moved faster on the cement. You can use visuals. 
image of riding a bike on gravel. What do you notice about that? What do you wonder about that? Or an observation. And once they got comfortable using the I notice, I wonder, that's when we started taking it into their environment because I really wanted them to start using their environment. Your environment is now your science classroom. You don't have the materials. You don't have the things that we use in the classroom. So I would start to give assignments that were going to go along with the investigation that we're eventually going to do. So this, this was a great one where I simply told them to start thinking about friction and asking questions. So this was a sample of what I got and I notice I wonder, I notice floor slips, I wonder why the rug doesn't. So he explained this one. He brought this to a Zoom meeting that he was sliding on the floor in his stocking feet and in his stocking feet he slipped on the floor when he slid on the rug he did not which was great that was such a great that's an investigation right there and we in fact did that investigation that was our investigation that we actually did at the i think it was one of our second zoom meetings where we sort of followed this through and they had to come to our Zoom meeting ready to do something. They had created questions, and I'll get to that in just a couple of minutes, uh, to do with this sort of thing. And they came prepared to have two different surfaces and something. Some had books, some had laundry baskets, one student used their shoe, and they simply tested it. And it was great. It was really great. And they had a lot of fun and it helped them connect. This is my classroom now. It's science is everywhere. I don't have to be in Mrs. Higgins' classroom to experience science. Science is in my living room right now. <clears throat> so as we would move towards creating getting to that where we're wondering, we're asking questions. Now we had to refocus on, okay, how am I gonna make a testable question? This is a little bit less structured than it was in the classroom. So this was a result of a lot of different discussions and a lot of giving permission to take some risks. Nothing has to be perfect show some questions that you might like to test. And this is one of the examples that I got. And again, this was a result of an assignment that they could turn in. And I had challenged each student was to come up with two different questions that had to do with evaporation. We're working on evaporation this week. So his says, one of my plans to test evaporation is to have water mixed with dish soap to see if it evaporates faster than regular water and then test it where the shade is. So that led to a great discussion on, we got too many variables here. His second question was, what happens when you put water on metal but in the shade instead of the sun? And again, great discussion with what do we want to test here? Do we want to test sun and shade or do we want to test metal and concrete? And I think those are some of the rich conversations that continued and were really exciting to me because they were simple. And this student even included his materials list Water, dish soap, cement, and shade. Great materials list. Great, simple, everything in his environment. And he was so able to work with that question and 
make a question that he could test that only had one variable. And it was one of the things, this, this was a student who really would have struggled with that in the classroom because he would have been overwhelmed by the amount of materials, by the amount of reading. And when everything had to be simplified because of distance learning, I saw students really grasp things that they had previously had a difficult time with. The other tool that I used a lot, and I used this in the classroom, but I, I used it a lot more and will continue to use it till the end of school, was giving them guidance with testable question formation because I had a lot of students come back to me with similar pieces of paper that had a million questions, a million thoughts, exciting, yes, because they're curious, they're excited, but trying to help them, how am I going to make all of this into a question with just one variable? So we use this uh, sentence frames where, and I would change this a little bit to kind of help guide them. Not all students needed this. There were students who would pass in a testable question. Those were great. They didn't go through this process. But this was so helpful with students understanding you got to narrow your thoughts, you've got to have one variable, and do I have everything in my environment to be able to do this? So on their own, they would refine it, and next steps might be, as with the friction investigation, bring your, bring your question to the next Zoom meeting. It might be do it at home and report back. So this is a couple of um, refined questions that students kind of got out of all their thoughts. Will water evaporate faster in sun or shade? Will water evaporate faster on wood or glass? Great. Easily done in their homes. Next step, just like in the classroom, now I'm going to develop my lab. So we had to think about, and this is the great discussions I'd have with students, how are you going to do this in your home? Do you have the proper materials? Can you make a procedure based on your environment? Some students were able to go outside, others weren't. Some students had a lot of siblings, a lot of materials in their house. Some students have very, had very little. And that was such a great learning, again, for the students. Science is all around me. I can do this. I can do this from my house. I can do this with the materials that I have. Some parents were able to jump in and help and go purchase materials, but I always made it really clear, you don't have to do any of that. We can figure this out together, how you are going to do this. They could turn it in, they could videotape it, or they could simply write it up, report their procedure, and share it at a Zoom meeting. Before I, I just want to tell a quick story because this was one of my favorite parts of remote learning. As difficult as remote learning has been, this was a moment that I thought, okay, there are really good things about remote learning. So this student, one of my students who was really confident, she was willing to do her investigation in front of everybody at a Zoom meeting. She had a really good investigation. And she needed a partner to help her do it. She couldn't do it alone because somebody had to be holding something else. And her brother was going to help her do it. Well, on the morning of the Zoom meeting, and she's ready, sort of. And then something happened. I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but something happened and her brother who was going to help her, who 
was no longer available. And she was a little bit panicked because she was really proud of what she had done. And she said, okay, hold on. And a minute and a half later, she drags her mother into the room. Her mother is in a bathrobe and a shower cap, is pretty embarrassed and shared that she's getting ready for work, but she will take whatever time is needed for her to help her daughter do this assignment. It was so incredible. And I, my heart, I thought, this is amazing <laughs> because this is a mom who I know has multiple jobs, is a single mom, and yet, you know what? My student is about to share the investigation. And mom held her parts, mom did, was sort of a, um, we were talking about like the sun and the moon and rotation and revolution, and her mom did everything that was needed to be done. And it was just, it was a very, very cool moment. And, in my classroom, we have not had a lot of parent involvement over the year, and I thought that that is parent involvement at its finest. So, another and a lot of great discussion too, as I can only imagine within that family. So, at this point, students can also simply share, and I wanted you just again have a couple of samples of the conclusions that student came, students came to after their investigations. Now, I did not, particularly at the beginning, worry a lot about perfect conclusions. I was more concerned with, let's go through step by step, let's go through the process and be scientists and we can start refining things as we go on. So this was the assignment after, I think this, I think these came from after the Zoom meetings. So in two or three sentences, report what you learned from doing your investigation. Uh, that water evaporates from heat and if water is together like a large puddle, then it will take long to evaporate. This was an investigation where the student had a puddle of water and time the evaporation. The student could go outside. And then she also took the same amount of water in the sun and spread it out so it wasn't a puddle. It was spread out over a large surface. And so she could see that. She could report out, here's what happened. This is another student I first tested in the sun and what I saw was the dish soap absorbed faster than regular water. The dish soap took nine minutes to evaporate and the plain water took 10 minutes to evaporate. This means the dish soap was faster. Okay, so a bit of a conclusion. Next, I tested both the dish soap and the water in the shade to see which would evaporate. First, it took the dish soap 21 minutes to absorb and then it took the water 16 minutes to absorb. This means, <laughs> this means the water has won and was the fastest. But what I saw here, they're keeping data. And this was such a good one to share at a meeting to show she's timing this, she's taking data, she's doing an investigation. Our next sample, uh, when water is around heat or sunlight, it evaporates. I noticed that metal gets warmer than the ground because the water evaporated faster. When water is in the shade, it takes longer to evaporate because it's cooler and there's no heat hitting the water so it can evaporate. So you can see that there's a lot of thinking going on. Is it perfect at all times? No, but these are great discussion points. And this is where I can reply, another student can reply. This is where I probably spend most of my time, which is something I really enjoy, when I can reply to a student and ask more questions. I can help them think about, what is it you're trying to say here? Tell me more. And they have to take the time to articulate their thoughts because I've asked them a direct question 
and an answer is expected. So that to me is another thing that I have found is a benefit to remote learning because I can be, I can still have those one-on-one -on -one classrooms. I can bring in another student and say, well, what did you get when you, when you did this? Did you get different results? I can have, I can encourage two students to reach out to each other and talk about this student saw this, this student saw that. And that's another great way that I have used Class Dojo a lot is to contact parents and say, I'm encouraging these two to talk. Would you support that? Now, my final slide. Is it perfect? No. Not even close, but is it progress? Yes. Do I feel incredibly proud of the thinking that I am seeing my students engage in? The discussion that I'm seeing my students engage in? Yes. Am I also seeing curiosity about their environment? Yes. And again, I think that one of the things that I've always wanted to accomplish as a science teacher is to help all students understand science is everywhere. There are so many cool things to ask questions about. There's so many cool things to investigate. And this has been a really exciting time to do that. So look at the resources you've got. Help the students continue to push themselves to be the curious scientists that you had in your classroom. Thank you so much for your time.